Uh, turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It's on page 555 in the Bibles that we have provided. It's kind of in the middle-ish if you're just hunting around for it and aren't, aren't real sure of where to find it. You know, when we engage in trying to discern what the Lord would have for us, you know, the Lord has given us, you know, history and accounts of what has gone on in the past. We have letters of instruction, but we also have in the midst of this what we would call wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. Wisdom literature helps us to walk rightly, but it takes into account some of the complexities of life. Imagine as you are learning to drive, or maybe some of you are learning to drive, and driving a car, there's a lot. It's a lot, right? If you want to slow down, you don't just stomp on the brake. If you want to speed up, you don't just put your foot to the pedal and and you don't just leave it there. If you want to turn left, you don't don't just go like this or or go like this. There's subtleties. There's things you need to know about what's going on with other cars and how traffic operates. And it doesn't mean that there's not absolutes, but in the midst of these things, uh, there's, there's judgments one has to make. And such is life, right? The Bible is, is very clear in places. There are moral absolutes. There is black and there is white. There, is, there are things that, that the, the Bible speaks definitively on. But there's also times where we need to make wise choices and understand that there's, there's difficulties in this world. And we, we kind of got to sort our way through this. And a lot of times, wisdom literature is a great sort of culmination of all of these things that, that come about. Now, sometimes... When we come to a passage, you know, it's, it's like it's laser focused on one issue and really digging in. But sometimes, and if you've ever read the book of Proverbs past chapter 10, you know, man, it just seems like they're all over the place. They're talking about this, they're talking about that, they're going after this, they're going after that. And it's difficult to understand the train of thought. Now, I don't believe the Bible is just someone doing stream of consciousness, writing whatever random thought comes into their mind. It's the Word of God, and it's superintended by the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean it's not difficult. So sometimes, most of the time, we come to a passage, it's like if you go hunting, right? I don't know how many of you out here hunt in Iowa, right? You have to use a shotgun to go hunting for deer, but you use a slug, right? One shot, just very focused to bring down the deer. But it's quite a bit different if you go dove hunting. (laughs) And there you have buckshot, and you're getting a spread, and just not sure kind of what's hits. Well, the passage today, it has like six, seven, eight different points. (laughs) It's a lot. And so instead, I know normally we go deer hunting, and we have that, that one shot that we're looking at. But today, Today we're going hunting for doves, and it's a big spread. So, so buckle in, turn into to chapter 4. A few things about the passage, just so you can know a little bit about the Bible that you're looking at. Uh, notice that one of the connective words that we will see throughout here is this idea of better. Better. That even under the sun, some things are better than others. And as the teacher here is looking at things under the sun... He notices things that are better, and I think they're, they're helpful for us here too. Um, you'll notice that, that a lot of these are observational, things that the teacher sees and understands. And so there are things, just because it is mentioned doesn't mean that he is in favor of it, but it is observations one makes about the world. And, and notice too that, that even though I've divided this into three points because you know, we're Christians and it's a sermon, right? That's, I feel like there's a law. If I don't do that, I get, a, I get a call from the other pastors. What are you doing? There, there are ties between the two. We'll notice that as we talk about society, delve into work, we'll go into work and then relationships. In fact, if you look at chapter 5, verse 1, many of your Bibles will have this note that the Jewish people that they kept the copies of the Old Testament for us that we can even have um, to this day labeled 
Chapter 5, verse 1 is a part of chapter 4, showing the connective force between these two ideas that may not be readily apparent as we just simply read things in a very topical fashion. And so, so with that, we're just going to take it. Take it as it is. It's the Word of God, and uh, we're going to see what God has for us. So chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed. They had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought that the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive, but better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw all that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. <laughs> this also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and a striving after the wind. Uh, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, and yet there is no end to all his toil. His eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for who am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Uh, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from the prison to the throne, through, and though in his own kingdom he had been poor. And I saw the living who move about under the sun that along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. And there was no end of all the people, of all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not replace him. Surely this also is vanity in a striving after the wind. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better. And to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what, that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, you are on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one that you must fear. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> in a passage with so many twists and turns, we ask for wisdom, for help. Lord, we want today to be not a speech of a fool. So, Lord, we need your Spirit to, to give illumination to your words in order that, that we might have wisdom, not from below, not under the sun, but from you. And so, Lord, we ask, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Use this time to your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. there, there are better ways to navigate through life. 
for all the despair that has led us up to this point. You might think, what's the point of doing anything? But there, are, there is a better path, and here we see the word better folded in time and time again. I've kind of broken down into three sections. With We have um, society, and then relationships, and then this thing I called meaningless words, um, and that really relates to our relationship with God. But let's start here, first of all, in society, and there's a, a, a key passage here in verses 1 through 3 that starts us out talking about oppression 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 it can take a lot of different forms i know some individuals and maybe even some in this room uh, your life is a living nightmare it's, you're in a, a controlled or somehow horrible environment and it, and it's and it rules and dictates your entire life i think most of the time though here when we look at the scripture they're talking about uh, a bigger sort of oppression think of governmental type oppression, the sort of things that happen at, at every turn, people are being put down. You know, I, as we wander into this, though, I, I do, there, there is a concern. Now, I'm not a sociologist, and kind of this is what I'm saying is somewhat anecdotal, but I, I do feel that kind of in this day and age, generally among us, that we are less resilient physically, mentally. We have less grit, less, less ability to maybe overcome obstacles. And we tend to maybe classify everything as sort of the end of the world and the sky is falling. And that's not helpful for us as we want to, to make progress in our world, but it's also not helpful as we kind of see some of the real problems in the world. I mean, even a, even a short glance at human history shows that, that oppression has been a major factor in, in many cultures and many societies. The elite would rule to their own pleasure just so they can have what they have, not caring about those underneath them. We've seen them here just even recently in the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their government outside of war. <laughs> Progress, right? Not so much. I mean, even as we engage in the world today, we're once again confronted with many of the difficulties as we play the Olympics under protest because of China's treatment of the Weiger people. As we pray for my friends, some of you have friends from Myanmar as the military junta has celebrated their one-year anniversary of oppression. As I have a, a friend whose college-age kids had to flee the country and they're worried about getting shot by roving bands. We, we live, we live in, a, in a day and age in which some of these things are, are bright realities in our own life. We've entered into... Um, walking with people that are refugees that have come to the Des Moines area. And now suddenly, it just becomes a little more real, the difficulties going on in South Sudan. Syria is no longer a vacation destination. We understand the, the, the violent land grab that's going on in eastern Congo. And of course, there's Afghanistan. It was interesting, I read some books by uh, Khalid Hosseini, The Kite Runner. Anyone familiar with that book, The Kite Runner? You know, I read that the first time, and I write these little reviews myself just to kind of keep track of the books. And I said, you know, this is real interesting, but oh my goodness, this guy is so wrong on, on so many things, <laughs> right? Arrogant, I think I know it all. And I did a little bit of research. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. I had, I had no idea. And as I read some of his other books, you, you just become aware of, of one layer after another, just regime after regime, just exploiting and oppressing, whether it's local, whether it's national, whatever. And I think it, it broke many of our hearts. I know some of you served over abroad, or at least I think many of us are aware of America's involvement over there in Afghanistan to, to, to pull away and watch it just reset right back to just an awful environment. 
We'll, we'll take some steps here later, but uh, the point is, is this, is that this is the reality. It's the reality for, for people's lives. Uh, society, though, can, can take other turns as well. Verse 4, <laughs> people live and work for the envy of their neighbor. That's a thing. That's a thing here. This people that, that simply do so that they can be a little bit better than the person next to them. We see it at work. You, you see it in, in academics and athletics. You just, you just want to be a little better than the person next to you. And what's, what's hard about that is that it limits true greatness. Right? If you're just trying to be next to the, better than the person next to you, you know, I guess it depends on who you're standing next to. I, I think some of this comparison in many of these ways is the thief of joy. It's become so dissatisfied that we feel like we're doing okay as long as we're just doing better than the other person. That's not a better that we should, we should measure. I think God has a different skill for us. And there's times where, again, competition does inspire greatness and pushes us ahead. But, but living your life just to, <laughs> just to have a little bit nicer car out in the lot compared to your neighbor is no way to live. The opposite, though, is true, too. Verse 5, the fool folds his hands, meaning he refuses to work and eats his own flesh. He doesn't literally eat his own flesh, but there's no food, so the only thing there to eat is, is his arm, right? It's a, and, and, and while I don't, I don't know, I don't see a lot of people with, you know, bite marks on their forearm, you know, wandering around, uh, we do know that sometimes just don't want to work. Just don't want to work. Just willing to throw themselves on the train tracks, hoping someone rescues them before the, the train really hits them. We see here kind of the conclusion is better as a handful of quietness than two hands full of soil and striving after the wind. There is something to be said <clears throat> to at the end of the day, being able to sit down and have a nice meal and enjoy it with someone you care about. Just being able to, to have that quiet moment. Just enjoy some of that. We, we see with the, the fool, <laughs> they maybe get to sit down, but they don't have any food to enjoy. The, the person that is living his life, comparing himself to other people, they might have a great meal, but they can't enjoy it because they're always worried about what, what someone else is doing. And then, of course, people living in oppression have have no meal and no enjoyment at all. The teacher transitions us a little bit to relationships, but still stays in the area of work. Verse 7, again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. We see in our relationships, some people, just, they just work to work. They don't have anyone to work for. They're not doing it for the benefit of society, and they're not doing it so that they can benefit someone else. They're just working to gain more and more. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, we see that a covetousness, a covetousness or a greedy person is really an idolater. So there's a theological issue where God becomes your money. Here, though, we are getting into this specific area of where not only, uh, it's a practical one. Like, what in the world are you doing? Why are you accumulating all this money? Just, you like seeing extra zeros in your bank account? It's doing nothing for you. You know, and, and they say, you know, a, a hearse never has a U-Haul behind it, right? You can't take it with you. But just imagine even if you could take it with you, Right? Somehow you're able to take all your wealth and melt it into gold bars and you get some, I don't know, sack that you can take it up, you know, to glory with you. I mean, what are you bringing? You know, low quality pavement, right? The streets are gold there. What are you doing? It makes no sense. No sense. Something that does make sense is this, is having a friend. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. I think oftentimes we walk through life, we think I'm doing just fine. I'm doing just fine. I don't need anybody. That's just not true. You think that your 
life insurance, your health insurance, you have some money in the bank, you know, I, I got a, uh, recently got a car, so it's still under warranty. You know, what can happen to me? Like a lot can happen to you. And there are these times where we need other people, and, and if we haven't made friends, they're just, they're not there. They're not there. He goes on with some horrible situations. Verse 10, if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. I actually know of a lady who didn't have friends. She fell. And she was on the floor of her living room for two days. I mean, it's a serious situation. It's a serious situation. It's, it's good to have people that care about you, to check in on you. Again, if two lie together to keep warm, how can one keep warm alone? I'd, maybe a marriage situation. Probably not. There's probably someone that's, that's out there and they're exposed in the elements and they're just trying to survive. And verse 12 is someone walking in a, in a neighborhood they maybe shouldn't be. They're, 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 they're come upon by those that would take advantage of them. But if, if there's someone else, there's, you're not as soft of a target. There's benefits to having friends. We need other people. A cord, a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. We, we need our relationships too because sometimes we think we know it all, but we don't. Verse 13, better is a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to take advice. And isn't that our situation oftentimes? We think we know it all, and since we know it all, we'll only listen to things that already agree with what we have to say. The difference, the difference, the key difference wasn't that one was young and old. It wasn't that one, as we'll see here in a moment, was poor and one was rich. It wasn't that one was unable to, to rule, was just simply among the, the peasantry, and one was the king. The key difference was one learned how to take advice, and the other one didn't. How do we, how do we see other people? They say something we don't like to hear. Are they an enemy? <laughs> Man, I want friends that speak truth to me, even if I don't want to hear it. And it's interesting, too, the way we have our relationships. We have this king that grows and becomes rather famous and has a following, but that, that fame does not endure. Again, that is striving and hollow and it's, it's vanity. We could speak a lot to that with our own social media situation. Uh, the clamor for more followers. The clamor for more likes. And then we take our final turn here in our relationship with God. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Well, if the king should listen to others, then all of us should listen to the Lord. But most of the time, we don't listen to the Lord. We are rash with our mouth. We're hasty in our heart to, to utter things to God. Tell God the way it is and, and what he should be doing. We come with a posture that, that we know best and the Lord, you need to kind of get it in gear. And it's interesting, sometimes we, we get before the Lord and really we are not praying, but we're worrying in God's direction, projecting to God a future without Him. <laughs> and, and here in verse, five, in verse 3, it, it has this interesting saying, for a dream comes with much business or busyness, really, and a fool's voice with many words. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen before, but maybe there's a season where you're really worried about something. There's a lot of things that are going on. And, and you start having kind of these bad or weird dreams. Any, anyone, ever, anyone ever experienced this? One time I experienced this, man, there's a lot of turmoil that was going on in my life. I was working at a, at a grocery store, and I was bag boy, right? I just put the bags in, and you know, I'm kind of a detail-oriented person, so I give way too much thought about how this ought to go down. You should, any rate. So I had this dream. All this other stuff was going in my life. This is like, and there's this endless line of groceries. And I'm like running out of shopping carts trying to put everything in there. And there's like, you know, 
lot of this chicken and stuff. You know, I just like, I couldn't manage it all. I'm like waking up and I'm like, I, I got issues. Well, in like fashion, <laughs> when we start piling and piling on the words, pretty soon the listener is listening to a fool's voice. And so we should, we should consider then what we say to the Lord. Now, uh, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us to pray continually, so it's not a, a lack of conversation. It's not saying that, you know, God gets tired of hearing what you all have to say. But it is but it is realizing who we are talking to. Now, here the issue is this making of oaths or promises to God. Now, why would you make a promise or an oath to God? And I I can think of a couple reasons that that aren't great reasons. One is that we want to show God that we are serious. We're serious. We're super serious. We're super duper serious, so we're going to take an oath. And we're super duper serious, and so we're going to take this oath so that you'll realize how sorry we are for whatever it is that we did, or, or that maybe if I do this, maybe then you'll love me even just that much more. That's one reason. Another reason is we want something from God. I'll promise you this, but you've got to give me that. We begin to have this sort of bartering relationship because we know that maybe without a promise, God wouldn't give us something good. We've got to kick him into action. Well, the cross really destroys both of those arguments. You see, at the cross, what we have is the understanding that, man, we're too far gone. <clears throat> a nice little promise isn't going to make everything right. We needed complete redemption. We needed to be sealed and filled with His Holy Spirit. We need to to have a righteousness that's not our own. And only that can come through Jesus. And and we also have a God who sees that, that we don't need just a little blessing here and a little blessing there. But we needed the greatest blessing of all Himself. And not only do we have Jesus dying for us, but we have Jesus in order that we might have union with him. And so we see God's infinite love, his unending grace. And that's what we get from him. So when when Jesus tells us, Matthew chapter 5, you don't need to make an oath at all. Just let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Talk honestly and forthrightly with God, but we don't need to amp it up. He knows how awful you are and his grace is deeper still. He has shown you that you are an object of infinite worth because he was willing to come and redeem you. We don't need to play the oath-making game. And just talk to him and realize he is God and we are not. So what do we do with all of this? So what do we do with all of this? Well, there's... There's really three items that I think are for us to wrestle around with. And, and the first one is this, is don't treat people as objects. Don't treat people as objects. We should not treat people as objects. People do not exist simply for you to get ahead in life. Or, or people are not there just simply to block your progress in moving forward. We need to have a new attitude when it comes to people. And sometimes we just see people in this light. We're just very self-absorbed. You know, on the issue of being aware of some of the things that have gone on historically and globally, we'd all do well to take a short-term mission trip. We would all do well to maybe watch a, a, a documentary that we might not watch. We'd all do well to maybe read a book that, that maybe talks about a time and a place that we're not real familiar with. We, we'd all do well to kind of reach out, even to some of our friends here, just take a moment and just say, hey, why don't you tell me kind of, What's going on in your life? To, to, to create some openness, to, to create some, some sympathy there for, for what other people might be going through just because maybe you live a pretty charmed life. You've kind of resided in your suburb and, and you're just not aware. 
We, we also just have to come to grips with the fact that we're just growing in our own self-absorption. We're just growing and growing in our, in our focus on us. And we, our marriages are suffering because of this, because we simply look at the other person, you're not meeting my needs. And it really is all about me, and so what are you going to do so that I am happy? And when you have both people taking that posture, it's just a disaster. There's little compassion, a little care and concern. We, we use people in other ways, too. Maybe we don't quite realize it. Maybe you're in sales and you just simply see people as a way that you can make money instead of seeing that, that you're offering a product that, that will help them and help their business, help their life. As, instead of serving, you tend to think of exploitation. You could turn that around. You could turn that around. And if you can't do that with whatever you're selling, you get a new job. But you, you need to realize that people just don't simply exist for your pleasure. I don't know how many of you have ever read the Babylon Bee, you don't need to raise your hand, but sometimes I like it. It's a Christian satire site. They make fake news, and it's sometimes just hilarious. And so they had this one just recently, and it was this, it was, it was, it was about this mom, this woman, she's a mother and a wife, who's discouraged, um, even though the creator of the world has shown her infinite love because she's not getting enough likes on her post, right? You know, and, and then that, you kind of have that situation where this woman is infinitely loved by the God who made all things. And then, you know, Jesus who, sent, who came to the earth and died and rose again in order that, that might have her forever and ever with her. And even then, too, she has an, an adoring and caring husband. She has kids that love her and what is the issue in her life not enough likes on my post someone on the internet is sideways with me we fall into that trap it's a key indicator maybe we are not maybe we don't have a good beat on people second kind of the opposite is work on your friendships work on your friendships you need to Look, a lot of people stink. Man, they're not great. They're hard to be around. You know, they, they don't call enough. They don't, you know, they don't think about you at all. Just selfish people, whatever. I get it. I get it. And I know you guys aren't. I mean, over here, yeah, but not. Right? <laughs> so we, we get it. We get it you need people. You need people. You need to be there for people, and people really, the way it should work, especially in the family of God, need to be there for you. And it takes time. You got to invest. It, the stance, I, look, I, I love our ability to work. I love our ability to get a ton of stuff done. But what that does is it crowds our schedule. We are packed to the hilt. And therefore, there's just not random time in which we have to go about just making friends. And it takes time and investment and, and being, and not, at least in our case, deliberate about that. Still need to do it. Still need to do it. To, to be friends, to obey the one another's, to be able to follow the Lord rightly. We need to be those kinds of people that are invested in others. So take some time. Maybe set aside some money, you know, set aside some cash, or at least in your mind know that, man, you know, sometimes my friends, they, they struggle, and I need to maybe be there for them in a, in a little bit different way. It's good for us. It's good for us. It's good for you to actually give money to another person. Everything that, uh, that, that goes through doesn't, you know, you can, you can do that. You can do that to be a blessing to other people. And then last, You need to think about your relationship with God. Think rightly about your relationship with God. I, th I think sometimes we're a little bit silly when it comes to God. Like, like we would never violate our rental agreement or not pay our mortgage, right? A binding contract, we've put that out there. And yet, you know, we... We say something to God and we, we, we totally neglect it. It's like we're Christian atheists. Like we, we believe God exists, but we act like he's not there. I mean, he's real. 
And the things we say to him, he hears, he knows. It's, it's that kind of deal. And so we just need to think rightly about the Lord that we're, we're, we're walking with. And, and, it's, and it's a little bit harder here. One of the great things I think we do is we show the, the eminence, the nearness, the relatability, the closeness of God. One of the things we maybe don't do as well is show God's transcendence, that he's altogether different from us. You know, I maybe share a few communicable, that's a big word, you'd know it if you go to the foundations class, attributes of God imperfectly, but by and large, God is wholly different than I am. He's wholly different than any of us. And we need to know that. You know, one of the things I did that greatly helped my life, one of the best things I ever did was I sat down and memorized verses just on who God is. Because my intuition doesn't lead me to great places. I, seem, I think God's kind of like me, only a little better. He's altogether different. Altogether different. And I need to, to tie those truths uh, to my heart. We're reminded here, A.W. Tozer here talks about this. He says, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is as pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. The most pretentious fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We see that, that, that he says here, I believe there is scarcely an error or doctrine or failure of applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect or ignoble thoughts about God. We need to know God, to not just trust Him for salvation, but to know Him, to search His heart, to pour through the Scriptures, to ask that He would show us who He is and what He is like and how then we walk before Him. Well, we, we get a special time now to be able to remember a key aspect of who God is. His love, His grace, His forgiveness towards us in Christ Jesus. I don't know how many of you have grabbed your communion kit. Anyone need those? A few instructions. Um, this is for anyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus. And if you don't trust in the Lord Jesus, we are so glad that you are here. Well, we hope that you continue to come. We hope that if you have questions, that um, we can be able to be here to help answer them. We, we, want, we want you to be here, but this is a time for Christians. And so if that's not you, um, maybe just simply use this time to kind of meditate on, on who God is or, you know, if he exists or whatever the Lord would have for you. But if this is you, then, then we want you to be a part of it. Um, I do want to say, you know, we're just making our way. We're trying to do the best we can. Um, some of the little kits, they're rough to open, like physically hard. So just maybe do a little prep work, work a little bit on the, on the bread part, um, and, uh, and get that squared away. If you struggle too much, um, I, I don't know, that we maybe have extra, we can, we can walk with you on that. And at the end, you can just put them in the baskets there. And then we have those two um, things for our benevolence offering, the boxes by the door, for those of you that call us to church home that would like to give extra to, to help those in need. What we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to pray. We're going to have a time where we reflect, and then um, we'll take the bread and the cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, and we just ask that, um, well, what we did just go hunting with, with buckshot, we pray the pellets would hit our soul. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to be men and women where our yes is yes, our no is no. People that, that make deep and abiding relationships, that have true friends, that we would really be the, the family you've called us to be. Lord, in a, in a world of evil, I, I pray that we would walk with wisdom. Lord, I ask for your grace. There's some here that are really struggling, maybe health-wise or financially. I pray that you would you would walk alongside them. There are those that are in maybe a rough relationship situation. I pray that you would give them comfort. Lord, there are, there are others, Lord, that just 
running away. Maybe you feel distant to them, and I pray that you draw them back. Lord, in this time, we just want to remember, be thankful that uh, we're not here because we somehow tricked you into loving us or we did enough to make ourselves lovely because you loved us in spite of the wrong that we've done. And you've done more than we could ever ask or imagine in order to rescue us. And so, Lord, we pray, stir in our hearts now.